So welcome, my name is Jay Buckley. I'm the director of the Charles Red Center for Western Studies. We're so excited to have you here with us today. Um, this lecture is named after um, Ronald and Lonnie Walker. Do we have some of the family that are here today? Welcome. Uh, we're so grateful for your family and their many years of faithful service at BYU and to the church. Ron was born in Missoula, Montana and spent his younger years in uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, his teenage years in Bakersfield, California. After graduating from his undergraduate, he served a mission in the Southern States Mission in the 1960s. Upon returning, Ron studied history at Stanford. There he met and married Nailani Midgley. While in California, he began teaching in the LDS Seminary and Institute programs. He acted as director of the program in San Francisco. The Walkers moved to Salt Lake City and Ron pursued his doctorate at the University of Utah while teaching at the University's Institute. Soon thereafter, Leonard Arrington hired him to join the burgeoning historical department. He quickly distinguished himself for his writing and meticulous research. Over his 40-year career, Ron published over 100 articles and eight books. His meticulous primary research and mastery of the historical narrative earned him numerous awards. He played an instrumental role in the creation of the New, New Mormon History Movement. In 1980, the church moved many historical department employees to the Joseph Smith Institute, Joseph Fielding Smith Institute at BYU, and Ron was uh, a named a professor. And ultimately, he also joined the history department. He found mentoring and teaching students to be very rewarding. He loved the students at BYU and treated them as colleagues, often eschewing their impulse to have them call him Dr. Walker. Generations will remember Ron for his contributions to Mormon history. His family, friends, colleagues, and acquaintances will remember him for his generosity, his faith, his church service, and his keen sense of humor. Ron and Lonnie welcomed many people into their home in Salt Lake City and created a community of scholars, church members, extended family, and even strangers. So we're grateful for hosting this award uh, along, or this lecture along with the Department of History. We'll now turn the time over to the Department of History Chair, Brian Cannon, to announce the Walker Student Award winner. Then Brendan uh, will introduce the speaker. So uh, one of the wonderful things that the Walker family has done is that they've made um, student research grants available uh, to students studying Western and Latter-day Saint history, and particularly to uh, students who uh, use uh, the Ronald Walker papers in special collections here at BYU. And uh, so uh, several students last year received research grants uh, for using uh, the Ronald Walker papers. And um, the winner of the Best Paper Award for last year is uh, Jared Clough. So if Jared's here, uh, please stand so we can recognize you. Jared's paper was entitled Heber J. Grant and the League of Nations uh, Controversy. So kudos to Jared for his prize winning paper. Good morning. My name is Brennan Rensing. I'm the Associate Director of the Red Center and very pleased to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Brent M. Rogers is the Managing Historian of the um, Church History Department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints up in Salt Lake City. He holds a PhD in History from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, a Master's in Public History from um, Sacramento State University, and a Bachelor's from San Diego State University. He has a long publication record of uh, articles, book chapters, um, many, uh, uh, many of which of these have uh, won awards. Um, his first um, monograph book published in 2017 
uh, was entitled Unpopular Sovereignty, Mormons and the Federal Management of Early Utah Territory. That book won the Best First Book Award from the Mormon History Association, the Francis Armstrong Madsen Best Book Award from the Utah State Historical Society, and the Charles Red Center Phi Alpha Theta Book Award for the Best Book on the American West. He is also the editor of six volumes of the Joseph Smith Papers, and um, and a million other things that I haven't mentioned. He has some new things in the works, which uh, hopefully we'll be seeing from him soon. Um, I'm really pleased uh, to hear him speak today about his brand new book, published just this year with University of Nebraska Press's Bison Books imprint, Buffalo Bill and the Mormons. So join me in welcoming Dr. Brent Rogers. Well, thank you very much for uh, that kind introduction, and uh, thanks for being here this morning. Given the title of my lecture, I'm going to begin in what may seem at first to be an unusual place, but I believe uh, it will all make sense in the end. I'm going to begin in July of 1885. In that month, a Latter-day Saint, uh, leader, organizer of the Young Men's Mutual Improvement Association named Junius F. Wells gave a powerful discourse about the purity of the Latter-day Saint home. For decades, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, then uh, colloquially known as Mormons, had been under attack much of the rhetoric, imagery, and even sites of violence in one form or another fixated on the Latter-day Saint home. Wells, a slender but sturdy, dark and handsome mustachioed man, was a son of Daniel H. Wells, a longtime counselor to Brigham Young in the church's first presidency. Junius had grown up in a Mormon home with a father who practiced plural marriage. As Junius grow, grew older, he traveled abroad in Great Britain and Europe as a missionary for his faith. Over the years, he had become a talented writer, organizer, and orator. Rather than continue this combat of imagery and rhetoric with just words, Wells in his discourse invited all to come to Utah and see for themselves how the saints lived. Let them go into our homes, and what will we show them there? He asked, we will show them respect of husbands for wives, wives for husbands, parents for children, children for parents, and for each other. We will show them faith. We will show them virtue. And we challenge them to deny the truth of our showing to the American people, Wells asserted. Though Wells like other Latter-day Saints, had long felt the hate of the world against him and against their faith, he believed in the pure intentions and desires of church members. The homes of the Mormon people are homes constructed upon the principles of purity and virtue, Junius Wells declared. His statement was meant to make a point, but he also understood the ways in which Latter-day Saints were seen and represented in American politics and culture. American politicians, press, and other writers were not ready to condone the Latter-day Saint home, nor see it as a place of virtue and purity, largely because of the practice of plural marriage. They portrayed the Latter-day Saint home as a home in chaos, a home of violence, a home of discontent. They often lumped together Mormonism with other foreigners and people deemed peculiar suspicious and even dangerous. They portrayed images of sexualized harems reminiscent of faraway lands and people, or as a tentacled, destructive monster that threatened all of American politics, law, economics, and society. American opinion makers argued that Latter-day Saints and their faith was a danger and even a threat to the proper American home, the place de designed and designated as the cradle of liberty and democracy. Good American homes needed to be protected and supported, especially in the West, the region the nation looked to as a place to grow and unite following the Civil War. 
In the heart of those Western lands, though, was a suspect people and religion, a people that supposedly forced downtrodden women into a life of drudgery, servitude, and abuse. In Utah, and with the Latter-day Saints, the American home was in danger, or so the narrative went. To remedy the perceptions of the nation and potentially suppress the efforts to alter the Mormon home, Junius Wells, along with other Latter-day Saints, called on all to come to Utah to see for themselves. At a time when this narrative about Latter-day Saints was at its most potent in the American imagination, William F. Cody, the frontiersman, an army scout who became a famous entertainer called Buffalo Bill, was among many cultural influencers who promoted an anti-Mormon image during the 1870s and 1880s. For nearly two decades, in his stage performances and in dime novels that featured him, Buffalo Bill built his early career with anti-Mormon imagery. His productions presented Mormons to the public in the way that the standing narrative did, as deviants from and dangerous to the American family. The sensational drama which he uh, starred in, which best represents Buffalo Bill's early portrayal of Latter-day Saints, was titled May Cody, or Lost and Won. The play, which first hit the stage in 1877, reenacted the Mountain Meadows Massacre. It claimed to depict the truthful incidents of horrible butchery of the massacre. It was a deliberately timed drama that rode the wave of current events, in particular, the heavily publicized trials of John D. Lee, the, uh, the only man who was convicted for his role in the actual Mountain Meadows Massacre that took place in southern Utah in 1857. It was a play that would have captivated American audiences. Simultaneously, they would have been fascinated with and repulsed by the Mormons they saw in the play. It was a play that amplified Cody's celebrity and star power and his finances. The plot of the play went a little something like this. May Cody, who was Buffalo Bill's sister, found herself, on the lone, uh, found herself alone on the streets of New York City. The main villain of the play, not coincidentally named John D. Lee, noticed the lone girl and formed a passion for her. He plotted to kidnap her and take her to be a part of his polygamous household in Utah. Buffalo Bill, however, discovered the plot and reached May 1st, and they began traveling away from the city west across the plains with the intention of moving to California. On the way, Lee, uh, under the direction of Brigham Young, waylaid them, and the Mountain Meadows massacre ensued. During the massacre, Buffalo Bill uh, was shown as one who manfully defended the wagon train against the violent Mormons. But even though he made his defense, Lee was able to kidnap May Cody and took her to Salt Lake City to meet Brigham Young, who then wished to force her into his own harem. Learning that uh, Brigham Young had taken his sister, I'm sorry, I went uh, one slide ahead too fast, that Brigham Young had taken his sister May to the temple to marry her, Buffalo Bill disguised himself as a Ute Native American warrior, rushed into the temple, and at the foot of the altar, before the ceremony could be complete, he battled Brigham Young, rescued his sister, and fled with her. At Brigham's behest, Lee followed in pursuit of the Cody's, and Buffalo Bill and John D. Lee engaged in a hand-to-hand -hand conflict with which Buffalo Bill ultimately hurled Lee to the ground, stood over him with a revolver, and claimed, Lee has lost and I have won. In this cautionary tale of danger and captivity, the hero got the best of the Mormons. Buffalo Bill vanquished the Mormon threat and freed his sister from forced incorporation into their religious snare and polygamous society. The play ends as May Cody could now ride off into the sunset, move to California, ostensibly to meet a real gentleman to marry and establish a proper family and home in the American West. Now, May Cody used a narrative formula similar to the other anti-Mormon performances and literature of the day. There were villainous Mormon elders and young women who needed to be rescued from kidnapping into polygamy. And there were, of course, dashing heroes who saved the day. 
Cody's play offered a commentary on the Latter-day Saint practice of polygamy and the perception that it was a vicious, lustful system that kept women in bondage. Setting the play's third act in the temple made a spectacle of the most sacred space to Latter-day Saints. It put the temple and its religious ceremonies on display as a place for sexual exploitation. Cody's dramatic interpretation thus was designed to prejudice audiences' understanding of Latter-day Saints, their faith, and their homes. The harmful depiction certainly would have influenced the perception of spectators who likely left the theater with less tolerance for Latter-day Saints than they had before entering, if they had had any at all. May Cody offered viewers a voyeur's look into the Mormon home, its sacred space, religious practice, portraying it all as titillating though strange and repugnant. Polygamy was, after all, the ongoing scandal that Americans loved to hate. Buffalo Bill's play put in front of the audience's eyes the potential peril of trafficking women into the Mormon fold. The play invited audiences to feel the thrill and horror of abduction and incorporation into Mormon polygamy and into the Mormon home. Buffalo Bill's timely anti-Mormon stage performances gave a face, voice, and visual understanding to the most negative tenets of the Latter-day Saints. At a time when politics and culture both targeted Mormons, popular audiences craved what they believed to be an authentic view of Latter-day Saints, and they believed they found that through, the Co through Cody's performances. Those performances depicted the religious group largely through the practice and presentation of the polygamous home as it was imagined in popular culture, not as it really was. American audiences witnessed on stage the differences in the home dynamics and life ways of the defamed religious group while Buffalo Bill was able to emerge as the symbolic champion and defender of the proper monogamous American home and family. This was the perception that Latter-day Saints faced and fought against in the last decades of the 19th century. It took individuals like Junius Wells inviting the world to come and see, to look beyond the perception and see the reality of the saints' homes. It took some doing and some time, but in 1892, Buffalo Bill Cody took an opportunity to really see the Latter-day Saint home for himself. On December 6th, 1892, Buffalo Bill arrived at the Templeton Hotel, a new, impressive, luxurious, six-story brick and stone structure located just south from the Beehive House in Salt Lake City. In the hotel's guest register, the celebrity inscribed his lavish signature, W.F. Cody, Buffalo Bill, and in the column designating the guest's place of origin, Cody simply wrote, the world. <laughs> he had become a man of the world by taking his stories about the American West to the Western world. In the decades prior to checking in at the Templeton Hotel, Buffalo Bill had become a household name. His life and exploits in the American West had become the stuff of legends, first written about him in the form of dime novels and plays before he took control over his own celebrity, becoming the star of the plays and performances such as the May Cody play, which we've discussed. But it was when he developed an entirely new genre of performance that he called the Wild West that his stardom was propelled to international heights. And in late December, or in early December, 1892, he was a top the cultural world when he checked into the Templeton Hotel. Catching wind of Buffalo's Bill, Buffalo Bill's visit that evening, a Salt Lake Tribune reporter arrived at the hotel just after Cody signed the guest register. He asked for an interview to which the famous visitor happily obliged. The conversation lasted 30 minutes. The Tribune reporter was curious about what brought the megastar to Salt Lake City. Cody, the told the reporter that he was eager to see more of the region, its game, and wonderful scenery. He had also wanted to explore the Grand Canyon and Great Basin to better understand the region and its potential for investment. And perhaps most of all, he wanted to have some fun. Buffalo Bill was a, a very uh, jovial individual. Junius F. Wells, um, 
is another poster of uh, Cody's B Buffalo Bills Wild West, just shows some of the, the action. Uh, but Junius F. Wells, who at this point is now a 38-year-old uh, church leader, was a key individual who organized the logistics of Cody's expedition. On October 19, 1892, he had packed a bag and boarded a train at Salt Lake City's Union Station headed east, traveling to New York City, where a telegram from William F. Cody awaited him. On October 25, Wells met with Cody and had a good friendly chat and went over the general plan of the trip west. In early November, they, uh, these two men, along with uh, an entourage of others, departed New York City by rail, first stopping at uh, North Platte, Nebraska to spend a few days at Buffalo Bill Cody's home. They eventually continued west, reaching the train station in Flagstaff, Arizona on November 10, where they met Daniel Siegmiller, Edwin D. Woolley, and an escort of nearly half a hundred Mormon scouts, cow cowboys, and guides. For the next few weeks, Buffalo Bill and his entourage hunted, hiked, and camped as they traversed the Grand Canyon from the south to the north. They crossed the Colorado River at a calm, serene point on the mighty waterway known as Lee's Ferry, a location named for the infamous John D. Lee in north central Arizona near the Utah border. Heading in a westerly direction around the brilliant red Vermilion Cliffs, the Cody expedition followed the same path trod by the Spanish friars Dominguez and Escalante in 1776. They moved west and then north, climbing forested mountains and crossing the expansive Kaibab Plateau in Arizona Strip, strip before uh, reaching the southern Utah Crimson Cliffs. They stopped at the border town of Kanab. While there, they met uh, two Latter-day Saint ecclesiastical authorities and received lavish hospitality from the Latter-day Saint residents of Kanab. Buffalo Bill and his company stayed at the Woolley home for a few days to rest themselves and their horses. Edwin Woolley's first wife, Emma, had prepared a full meal, including a dessert for her distinguished guests. As they sat down to uh, consume their dinner, Edwin asked Buffalo Bill to say grace. Though not a religious observer himself, Cody obliged his host. With the sight of dessert and its smell wafting in the dining area, Buffalo Bill bowed his head along with the others and uttered this prayer. God bless the hands that made them custard pies. Cody and his company uh, enjoyed conversing with the Woolies as they ate their supper a delicious dessert. One of Woolies' daughters, Mary Elizabeth, was fascinated by these visitors, uh, listening with rapt attention to their plans and tales. While Cody and the others stayed at the Woolly home, Mary observed that it was the scenery and the people that most impressed the famous visitor. Following the brief stay in Kanab, the party proceeded northward to Richfield, Utah, and then took the rails to Salt Lake City, reaching there on December 6th, the evening of which Buffalo Bill checked in to the Templeton Hotel. While in Salt Lake City, Junius Wells introduced Buffalo Bill and others in his party to the First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which then consisted of Wilford Woodruff, George Q. Cannon, and Joseph F. Smith. Following the visit, George Q. Cannon uh, remarked in his journal that Cody is a very fine-looking man and wears his hair full length. Like many reviewers of Cody's stage plays and probably the tens of thousands of others who had witnessed Buffalo Bill's performances, Cannon commented specifically on the great scout's physical appearance and manly beauty. Church President Wilford Woodruff also recorded in his journal that Buffalo Bill and his company were very much pleased with their visit to Salt Lake City. For his part, Buffalo Bill likewise praised the people of Utah and the church leaders. Wilford Woodruff, the president of the church, who had just two years prior to this visit called for the beginning of the end of plural marriage, was called a wonderful man who was friendly and even kind after passing through half a century of utter and almost relentless agitation against his faith. That impressed Buffalo Bill. George Q. Cannon impressed Buffalo Bill as a remarkably bright man with great mental activity. 
After spending ne nearly six weeks together, Junius Wells bade Cody and his entourage farewell as they boarded a train and departed Salt Lake City on December 8th. Following his uh, expedition to the Grand Canyon and through Utah, Buffalo Bill offered some public commentary about Utah and its majority population. After spending time in the Mormon homes and with Mormon families, Cody offered them praise. He was grateful that they treated him with great consideration. He remarked on their devotion to family and piety. Those Mormons are the greatest people to pray I ever saw, and they have the regular old Methodist twang about it, Cody said. <laughs> Though subtle, Cody made a direct connection between Mormonism and a prominent mainline Protestant denomination, thereby giving a knowing nod to their growing respectability and acceptability. Further commenting on the Latter-day Saint habit for prayer, Buffalo Bill quote, quipped, excuse me, they can pray for more things and for a longer space of time than any set of people in the world. <laughs> they had me down on my knees eight or ten times a day. <laughs> Cody's public remarks also did not shy away from the long-standing question of polygamy among the Mormons. The Mormons, he told this Washington Post reporter after his visit in the, the homes of these Latter-day Saints, are law-abiding, energetic, and hardworking people. They are living up to the letter of the law against polygamy, he stated with no uncertainty. This 1892 visit to Utah proved to be a turning point for Buffalo Bill Cody. Having spent time in the Mormon home and observing these people of faith in their own environment, Buffalo Bill saw these individuals and this group differently. He witnessed their positive accomplishments and redeeming attributes. Cody viewed them as more complex than the singular negative character type of his previous performances. These statements from the most popular American celebrity of his era signaled that Mormons could now be seen as good, respectable American citizens living in good, respectable American homes. Junius F. Wells had declared that the homes of the Mormon people are homes constructed upon the principles of purity and virtue, as he once extended an open invitation to visit Latter-day Saint homes. Wells led Buffalo Bill Cody into the Mormon home, and the great showman was impressed, even convinced by the virtue he witnessed. As a man with great prestige and cultural and social influence, his remarks about Latter-day Saints held great potential to further dispel ignorance and prejudice that had been long-standing toward the faith. The 1890s were a turning point for the general perception of Latter-day Saints. The public declaration that Latter-day Saints would no longer practice plural marriage went a long way in altering that perception, but there was a lot more to it. As individuals, families, companies, and even the United States government looked at the land and opportunities in the American West, they only had to look at the Latter-day Saint example in Utah to understand how the arid landscape could become cultivated and productive. Growth in the West depended on the ability to harness and manage the limited water in the region. The Saints had built a vast irrigation network that produced an immense agrarian society in an arid region. They were being seen as having provided a blueprint for successful growth in the New West. Buffalo Bill understood this as he observed it firsthand while touring through Utah and visiting the Latter-day Saint homes. By 1898, the uh, former star and producer of the anti-Mormon stage play Mae Cody uh, was growing a development in the Bighorn Basin in northwest Wyoming that he uh, was, was struggling to populate. But he had become so favorable toward Utah and Latter-day Saints that he viewed them as a model for settlement in his region. He was particularly interested in looking at Latter-day Saints and what they could bring and help show other settlers in the Bighorn Basin. In April 1898, he penned a dispatch to C.B. Jones, a land agent from Galesburg, Illinois, who had been helping to bring settlers to Northwest Wyoming's Bighorn Basin. In his message to Jones, Buffalo Bill outlined 
the characteristics and qualities people needed not just to endure, but to flourish in that region. Patience, persistence, and long-suffering through hardship, Cody explained, were essential qualities. He asserted, the possibilities of this new region I have no fears are as grand as any which have followed other pioneers in the older western states. We have only to look at what the Mormons have done in the Great Salt Lake Valley, which at the time of its settlement was the most desolate of deserts. They have made it blossom as the rose, and today there is no more prosperous and wealthy state on the continent taking into consideration all the circumstances than Utah. Cody was promoting his own interests by using the Latter-day Saints as a model. We have in the Bighorn Basin resources that are not only infinitely greater and more varied than in Utah, Buffalo Bill declared, and I have no doubt that one season's effective work by our well-to-do settlers will show as great results as have been accomplished there. Cody's vision of attracting American families and American homes to the Bighorn Basin mirrored what he observed of the Mormons and their own efforts in the Salt Lake Valley and beyond. Now, Buffalo Bill's private letter to Jones was not his only writing that praised the saints at this time. In a book uh, that he authored with Henry Inman titled The Great Salt Lake Trail, published in 1898, the same year that Cody wrote to Jones, Buffalo Bill placed the Latter-day Saints and their homes and their pioneering industry center on the stage. Out of the most desolate of our vast arid interior areas, in less than half a century has been evolved not only a magnificent garden spot, but a great city with all the adjuncts of our most modern civilization. Rich in its architecture, progressive in its art, with a literature that is marvelous when the conditions from which it has sprung are seriously considered, the Mormon community meets all the demands of our ever advancing civilization, the authors wrote. Inman and Cody then spent an entire chapter in their book extolling the Latter-day Saint work ethic, organization, cooperation, and systematic program of expansion that produced a fruitful network of canals, roads, agricultural fields, and most importantly, homes. The Mormons were viewed as commercially successful irrigators in an arid region that needed water. In their history and by their example, Buffalo Bill Cody found some hope for his own endeavor in community building in the West. As the 1890s drew to a close, Cody needed some pioneers to help reclaim the hinterlands of Northwest Wyoming and turn that space into a pioneer's paradise. Little had been accomplished in the region by the end of the century, though Cody spent great, uh, great amounts of funds. The region lacked people and infrastructure. But Buffalo Bill was a man of action and he recognized what Latter-day Saints could bring to the place he was building. These Latter-day Saints who conquered the arid lands and made them blossom as the rose were the type of people Cody could respect. He had embraced their heroic pioneer narrative that had increased Latter-day Saint respectability. <laughs> Though he had used caricatures of Mormons as feared outsiders to sell profitable dramas, he now saw the individuals of this religious group primarily as productive pioneers, and he moved to embrace them in his determination to develop the Bighorn Basin. And he was not shy about encouraging Latter-day Saint settlement in the region. His goal was to open that country and settle it with happy and prosperous people, so he told a Midwestern newspaper reporter in mid-January of 1900. I am going up to my town in the Bighorn Basin in Northwest Wyoming, he said. I've got 200,000 acres of land up there, and I'm going to unload the whole ruckaboo onto them Mormons. <laughs> he then said to this interviewer, look at what they've done with the Salt Lake country. Well, I expect them to do the same thing in the way of irrigation in the Bighorn Basin. Buffalo Bill knew that access to water for agricultural purposes was vital to the success and continued growth of the basin. And while the work on his own irrigation canals was moving forward at a sluggish pace, he believed that these successful Latter-day Saint irrigators could help save his dreams for the, for the Bighorn Basin. Abraham Woodruff, a young Latter-day Saint apostle, uh, son of Wilford Woodruff, 
and a colonization agent for the church led a group of saints up to the Bighorn Basin in early February 1900 to see the prospects of settlement in the region and to meet Buffalo Bill. Woodruff wrote in his journal about meeting with Buffalo Bill and of hearing his stories. After a brief visit uh, and a survey of the, the area, Woodruff parted ways with Cody uh, with the beginnings of a business deal in hand. Buffalo Bill understood the Saints' willingness to settle in the Bighorn Basin could help further his plans to build up his own town of Cody, Wyoming, and to entice a railroad to build there. As droves of Latter-day Saint families began their move from Utah to Northwest Wyoming, Buffalo Bill wrote to Charles Manderson at the Burlington Railroad offices in Omaha, Nebraska. Cody told Manderson that the Latter-day Saints were immense, immensely pleased with the country for agricultural and stock raising purposes. Cody claimed that Abraham Woodruff said that if a railroad was built into the basin, that many thousands of their people would move at once to the basin and go to farming and stock raising. But without a railroad, he told the executive, only a small number would come, as it would take a railroad to move the crops for any great number of farmers. With such possibilities available, the ambitious Cody wondered aloud in his letter why the Burlington Railroad would hesitate in extending its line to the Bighorn Basin. Beyond the large and prosperous uh, Latter-day Saint colony, Cody reminded the Burlington Solicitor General of the plentiful mineral resources, timber opportunities, and vast tracts of rich farmland in the Bighorn Basin. With the saints moving there to demonstrate the potential of the basin, Cody said, all that was needed to make the basin the very richest portion of America was a railroad. In this communication and uh, in other advertisements, Buffalo Bill employed the Latter-day Saints and the Latter-day Saint home as a selling point as he worked to promote growth in Northwest Wyoming. Others got on the bandwagon as well. Uh, the Buffalo Bill newspaper in the area, the Cody Enterprise, expressed admiration of the Latter-day Saint home as the foundation of settlement in the region. Referring to the saints as industrious people and good citizens, the newspaper asserted these, uh, the progress these frugal and intelligent workers are making in this county borders upon the wonderful. The enterprise lavished the religious settlers with superlatives such as unfaltering courage, heroic, gritty determination, and Herculean as its columns depicted the success that has always followed their efforts. Though some uh, in the region remain concerned about the religious group and the influence it would have on regional economics and politics, the standard narrative of the Latter-day Saints and their utility in fostering development to make the arid West blossom as the rose became entrenched. At the national level, it was William Smythe, the renowned journalist and Western reclamation promoter who wrote a glowing article for Harper's Weekly about Latter-day Saint success, settlement in Northwest Wyoming, and the brilliance of William F. Cody. Smythe discussed the ongoing negotiations between church authorities in Salt Lake City and Buffalo Bill Cody to purchase large tracts of land and an irrigation enterprise in the Bighorn Basin. Though Cody had not begun his operations in the Bighorn Basin with the idea that it would be a Latter-day Saint colony, he did desire to see tens of thousands of homes and farms there as an enduring monument to his work in the West. Smythe applauded Cody's genius for not only recognizing but also facilitating the saints' success by providing them with land and water rights. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was not just a religious institution, Smythe concluded, but a great business organization with brains, brawn, and far-reaching capital. Smythe said, upon that institution, Colonel Cody deposited his burden and his dream, and it was gladly accepted. And in the next few years, homes and factories and temples will rise on the virgin soil of another valley. Smythe's message was that intelligent businessmen and urban developers like Cody need only work with the Latter-day Saints to ensure their success in growth and development. Through their system of cooperation 
They built canals, they helped build a railroad, and they built towns. The Mormons had taught Cody and the nation how to unleash natural resources and provide homes in the arid west. Smythe asserted, once again, Latter-day Saint success had shown the way to establish necessary infrastructure for that development. He closed his article by emphasizing that if the opportunity be grasped in the right spirit, the American people may yet acknowledge a debt of gratitude to their Mormon fellow citizens for having shown them the way. The thrifty, industrious saints were again praised for their role in converting a desert into a veritable garden spot. Their success was crucial to advertising the possibilities and opportunities in the New West. And Cody was not shy about employing his, this image of the saints in his efforts to bring more American homes to Wyoming's Bighorn Basin. He was the one that helped bring the Mormon home to Northwest Wyoming as a model to grow a space for the American home. In essence, the Mormon home had become an American home. Buffalo Bill Cody returned again to the heart of the Latter-day Saints home in the summer of 1902. He was on tour there with his Wild West in Congress of Rough Riders. He had a packed itinerary while he was in Salt Lake City, thanks in large part to his old friend, Junius Wells. Several days before Cody's arrival in Salt Lake City, Wells contacted the showman to arrange a series of visits and entertain entertainments. Cody was excited to see his old friend and accepted Wells' kind invitations. Following the Wild West afternoon performance on October, excuse me, August 13, Cody met Utah Governor Heber M. Wells, Junius's younger brother, for dinner. He then visited several other friends prior to the evening show, which, like the matinee, dazzled some 15,000 spectators. The next morning, Wells arranged for Cody and his daughter, Irma, to meet with the Latter-day Saint First Presidency which then consisted of Joseph F. Smith, Anthon H. Lund, and John Henry Smith, at the Beehive House, the historical home of Brigham Young, and the church president's current residence. This was the first time that Cody's daughter, Irma, who would have been about 18 years old at the time, had the opportunity to visit with Latter-day Saints in Utah. If it was nothing else, it was a symbolic visit. Buffalo Bill had brought his precious daughter into the most prominent of Latter-day Saint homes where they were welcomed and treated as esteemed guests. No record of Irma's experiences or thoughts uh, has been located, but uh, Anthon Lund described Irma as, quote, a nice girl when he wrote about her uh, and meeting with Cody in his journal. Buffalo Bill emerged from the meeting uh, with praise, again, for the Latter-day Saints. The Deseret Evening News described the meeting as an effort to cement the friendship that had developed between Cody and the Latter-day Saints. The newspaper declared that Buffalo Bill emerged from the meeting with words of praise and commendation for the Mormon people. He, left, uh, he and his daughter left the rendezvous with these Latter-day Saint leaders and hurried to the tabernacle to attend a special organ recital with his company of some 300 uh, performers. It was a concert held specifically in honor of Buffalo Bill and his Wild West. After the performance, he uh, again spoke with the Deseret News, and he gave a brief interview in which he said uh, that he relished the event and gave high compliments to the singers and organists. He exclaimed, wonderful, the most marvelous building all things considered, I was ever in, and certainly the most marvelous organ I have ever seen or heard, both the creations of a wonderful, yes, a very wonderful people. Following the organ recital, Buffalo Bill, his daughter, and his cadre of performers walked the grounds around the Latter-day Saint Temple, marveling at the magnificent edifice that boasted beautiful Gothic and Romanesque architectural elements. After 40 years in construction, the temple had been completed and dedicated as a sacred space for the Latter-day Saints. It had once served as an icon, a symbol of a nefarious faith group, a symbol that Cody himself negatively portrayed in his stage plays. But now the Salt Lake Temple had come to represent a friendship, a friendly people, an industrious people, a good people. 
Having toured the temple grounds, Buffalo Bill and his performers paused for this photo opportunity. Following the photo opportunity, Buffalo Bill and his contingent dispersed, returning to the arena several blocks away to prepare for their afternoon and evening performances. The two Wild West shows that day filled the arena to the brim. Spectators cheered as Buffalo Bill and the Cowboys rescued the immigrant, immigrant trains and settlers from attacking invaders. The crowd roared watching race, races of horses, daring feats of horsemanship, and expert shooting displays. The celebrated scout commented on the turnout. He said, quote, it simply proves what has so often been said of Salt Lake. It is the greatest amusement center of its size in the country. At the height of his international popularity, Buffalo Bill did big business in Utah's capital city. Now for the next uh, 10 years of Buffalo Bill's life, much changed for him. Uh, his business interests struggled and his iconic Wild West uh, fell on hard times, even going bankrupt. Uh, after which he reluctantly joined the Sells Floto Circus and returned to the grind of touring. He returned with the Sells Floto Circus in June 1914 to Salt Lake City. The newspapers mentioned the return of Buffalo Bill, the most famous American, but it was the 40 clowns, the pretty lady, the bearded woman, the skinny man, and the menageries of wonderful animals that seemed to attract the most attention at this time. Whether it was Buffalo Bill or the circus curiosities, crowds still came out to see Buffalo Bill as he visited the cities of Salt Lake, Ogden, and Logan. While he was in Salt Lake City, Buffalo Bill again renewed acquaintances with old friends, including his friend Junius Wells. He was, again, as he had been, uh, privy to visits with the First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He and Joseph F. Smith uh, discussed the olden days. They reminisced about pioneer life and overcoming the land and peoples of the West. Um, they had a, uh, a special organ recital, again, for Buffalo Bill. And... They uh, presented him with a, a statue uh, made by Avard Fairbanks. It was a great visit um, for Cody as he uh, had his second to last visit to Utah. But by this time, I think it's important to note uh, a reconfiguration of memory that had taken place. So you can read on the slide the full quote, and I'll say it from the, the Ogden Standard, how they presented it. In days of old, when they were not so well and favorably known and the practice of polygamy created almost universal prejudice against them, the great scout was one of the best friends of the Mormons and was always ready to praise them for their industry, thrift, sobriety, honesty, and other desirable characteristics as he had observed them during their operations in the course of making the desert blossom as the rose and establishing the nucleus of our now great and prosperous Intermountain Empire. Cody's anti-Mormon performances of the 1870s and 1880s had long been forgotten. Instead of a fascinating trajectory that began with pernicious perceptions of the Mormon home displayed on stage and concluded with a mutual embrace and influence, this Utah newspaper collapsed the narrative to highlight a constant positive connection between the place, its people, and the celebrity. Buffalo Bill did the same. In his last visit to Utah in June of 1950, he spoke to an audience with a clear and resonant voice that it was his pleasure to appear before an audience many of whom were descendants of the hardy pioneers who trekked across the plains and made the valley blossom as the rose. In that moment, like most of his public declarations about Latter-day Saints during the preceding 23 years, Cody collapsed his experience into a soundbite. The message he articulated had remained constant during that time. His sentiments about the Latter-day Saint home 
that had produced industry and irrigation works had drawn praise from him since the 1890s. And he had not wavered from that conviction since that time. These, his last words, uh, last known words to a public audience in Utah revealed a deep admiration for the hardy pioneers and the home they created in the Intermountain West. It wasn't always so, but it had become, in the eyes of Buffalo Bill, not just a proper, but a model American home. It was a home that was just as Junius Wells had advertised when he invited the world to come and see. I just want to end uh, my remarks with an expression of gratitude and thanks. Um, first, I want to acknowledge what an honor it is to be able to, uh, to give this lecture. To be selected to give the Walker Lecture is an immense honor of which I'm, I'm very grateful for. Uh, I had some opportunities throughout my life to discuss history with Ron, uh, Ron Walker and always felt of his knowledge uh, his spirit and his kindness. And I always left a meeting with him uh, feeling good and having learned something new. And that's a, that's a great feeling to have when you can go to somebody uh, who you know, takes an interest in you and uh, makes, you, makes you feel good about the ways in which you, you want to explore. Uh, and I, I'm grateful to Ron for that. Uh, so I just want to say thank you to the Walker family. Um, and I, I, I want to thank uh, the Red Center for this opportunity, the Department of History, for sponsoring this event. Uh, I want to thank my good friend, Dr. Brendan Rensink, for inviting me to speak. I'm really very truly grateful for this opportunity. Um, and I, I would like to also acknowledge the Red Center um, and as well as the Buffalo Bill Center of uh, the West in Cody, Wyoming. Both institutions supported me during my research and uh, the publication of my book. Um, which is um, just more than, more than I could have ever hoped for, and, and I'm grateful to those two institutions. And finally, thank you all for being here today. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Or... Yeah. So, the many Cody playing, when did he ever stop performing? And what was that like? Okay, the, the question was about the May Cody play. And did he stop performing that? Uh, yeah, he performed it from 1877 through 1879, um, and then it was uh, it, it was discontinued at that point. During the same time frame uh, is when he developed a play that was called uh, "The Red Right Hand." It was a, a performance about his experience um, in fighting some Cheyenne warriors, and uh, right after the Custer's Last Stand. And that became so popular that that was, that was what, uh, I mean, basically what people wanted to see. And so, yeah, he's, he kind of quit uh, the May Cody performance in favor of uh, the, the red right hand. Yeah. Follow up, I suppose. Did he ever write one that favorably portrayed the members? Like in one place? <laughs> no. Oh, sorry. The question was, did he ever portray a performance in which he uh, favorably portrayed Latter-day Saints, right? Uh, no. The answer is, is no. So he, as he moved from the stage and into the Wild West arena, the show kind of uh, shifted to more um, like an attack on the settler's cabin that he and others would, would protect the you know, settlers from. The attack, it was more about uh, horsemanship and horse races and uh, shooting displays than it was about, um, you know. So, the, so the, the, the genre shifted from the stage to, to the Wild West arena, and he did not, um, he really didn't have Latter-day Saints in those performances af, you know, after about uh, late 1880s. They didn't show up. Now, there were dime novels um, that were written about Buffalo Bill that did still uh, present him going up against Latter-day Saints. Um, and there is one about 1905 that he uh, th that is featuring him. Now, he's not writing these. These are things that are written about him. And so um, it's a little bit different. And there is still some of that same narrative uh, that's going on about Latter-day Saints, even in 1905. But, um, but what we hear from Buffalo Bill has, has shifted quite a bit by that time. Yeah. 
Yes. I'm just curious. It, it wasn't lost in your narrative. At the end, you used the phrase "come and see," and you do this wonderful job of talking about how, through uh, Brother Wells, really this perception changes. I'm just curious how you came into wanting to write from that vantage point because you start really at the beginning with Brother Wells, and you kind of come back to the end of what a dramatic difference yeah. the paradigm for you know, Buffalo Bill is as a consequence of his actions. So, how did you land on on that as a framework for your lecture and for your writing. The great question. Um, the question was about uh, the framework of sort of starting with uh, Junius Wells and then uh, the invitation to come and see and then to uh, see Buffalo Bill's experiences and then and then where we end up. Um, really, I think I would say that and maybe this, you know, for uh, some of the, the historians in the room is maybe uh, but you write from the sources, like you kind of you see what the sources have, and you you write the story based on what the sources tell you, and that was something that uh, you know as I, so I, I have to give a little bit of background on on the research. So I didn't know very much about Junius Wells or his relationship with Buffalo Bill Cody until um, I found well I should say I found it was in the the archives an unprocessed collection of the archives of the church history department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and um, as far as I could tell no one had ever uh, cited to it uh, or you know used it in research and so as I found that he had played this role in bringing Cody out I started looking into him more and then saw this uh, doing research on Wells found this discourse in which you know he's he is inviting the world to come to the to Utah right which is it's a pretty big statement it's a pretty big thing to to say when you know the whole world is sort of against you uh, to say hey just come and see just come and see for yourself and this invitation and then that he plays this role throughout in being the liaison between the Latter-day Saints and Buffalo Bill Cody um, you know the the story just kind of it just happened right like I mean it, you, you you see the the things as they progress and that's what the sources were were telling me and so you know part of the the telling of history though is trying to find something that's a, a good uh, you, you have you have what the sources are telling you and then how can you present that to somebody and I just thought that that was a really strong maybe even powerful way to bring people in um, whether they're whether they're a latter-day saint or not or what you know whatever uh, whatever group of people that, that somebody might identify with, I think it's a universal message that, hey, if you just get to know me, if you just get to know my, my friends and my, my people or get to know my life, like, you'll appreciate it. You'll understand me. We'll be able to find some common ground and connect. And I think that there's, uh, the way that I finish the book kind of get, gets at this point of, we all have our stories. We all have our things that we, uh, that we like to do or that we believe and we like to talk about that, but it's, it's the listening to it and then coming in and seeing and, and being able to come to the center, come to the middle, find out something about somebody else that is where real change happens and where real connections happen. And so I think that Buffalo Bill's story and the role that Junius Wells plays in it uh, shows that in a, in a really interesting dynamic from a historical sense, but also is something that I think, you know, why, why do we study history? So we can learn more about our present and our future. What can it teach us? It can teach us how, if we just maybe get past some of the perceptions that we have, we can come and see and get to know other people and come to love and appreciate them for who they are. I saw one other hand here and then... Yeah, um, you mentioned... I think it was Edwin Lloyd, or Edwin Lloyd, um, when he stayed at uh, Buffalo Bill stayed at his house, that it, uh, Lloyd's first wife was the one who cooked the meal and everything. Um, so at this time, polygamy was still present, if I understand correctly. It just wasn't being continued. Like there weren't new marriages. Was like there was there evidence for Co that Cody like was aware that. She what like this was a polygamous household, or was this something that he just wasn't aware of, or like I guess I'm asking because I'm trying to figure out is this a change in his vision of what a polygamous household might have looked like, or is he thinking oh well now that they're 
like doing away with this, I have no other problems and I can see the, the rest. Good, yeah. um, so the question is about uh, Edwin Woolley's family and, and Cody uh, seeing, seeing them in their home and whether, um, if, hopefully I'm getting all this right, but whether uh, Buffalo Bill is, is seeing that this is a polygamous home and, and what that does for his, his perception. And so um, uh, the short answer is yes. He recognizes that plural marriages like, are still a thing, right? Like the 1890 manifesto happens and it's not just like, oh, everybody, you know, separates and good luck to the, to the, you know, women and, and children of the, you know, second through whatever number of wives. Um, and, and in the interview that he gives with the Washington Post after his, he even, he even says that, he's like, like look, I, he shows some empathy or sympathy for the fact that um, some of the wives do like, get different residences and they get breaking up these families. And there is, uh, you know, like I said, some sympathy that, that isn't a great thing for them. So he understands that it's a, uh, you know, like a phasing out, right? It's not just a cut when we're, we're not practicing polygamy anymore. Now we're, now we're all monogamous and things are great. Um, but he recognizes that, you know, that even in this home, there's a great, you know, a great family dynamic. There's a, a great meal being prepared. Like, it, so um, does, that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Well, that, um, that he, it's not like he's ignorant to the fact that, uh, that plural marriages are still part of Utah and Mormon or Latter-day Saint society. And it wasn't just a hold back. It was a change in view of what that society would look like even with polygamy as well. I, I think, even if it's being phased out. yeah, I think that he, I think like most Americans, he would have said, okay, it's being, it's being phased out. And like I had in that quote, uh, they're, he's, they're living up to the letter of the law on, on polygamy and that, that's a good thing. Um, and so seeing that it's moving in that direction is positive, but it's not like he's, you know, still down because there is still, you know, polygamous households. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, you bet. Um, yeah, Dr. Woods. So this, uh, I, I'm curious um, about this model and if you've had an opportunity to share it in Cody because having recently been up there and interviewing people with attention to the temple and all that, it seems like this is such a great model to remind people of the early roots and to get back to this uh, understanding and shared community. And so... I was just wondering if you might have been invited in an academic setting to go to Cody in an indirect way to try to generate light instead of heat, mm -hmm. because it seems like a very safe historical model to do some good things for everybody. Yeah, so the question is asking if I've been invited up to the Cody, Wyoming area to uh, speak about about uh, this book and, and this topic. Um, not yet. Um, I hope that you know, the people in Cody are aware of, of the work. I mean, I know that the folks at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West are, and, uh, um, uh, and I hope they're reading it at least. And, and, you know, maybe there will be an opportunity some point in the future. But if there is, I'd love to go. It's a great place, beautiful. Uh, I can see why Buffalo Bill wanted to build that place up because it's, uh, it's gorgeous. And I would love to have that opportunity at some point, uh, but not yet. So the church um, was generally um, a fine about uh, Buffalo Bill's attempt to draw people away from the Salt Lake Valley, or did they have any issues with that? Okay. Yeah, so the question is, um, how did the church respond to Buffalo Bill's recruitment of Latter-day Saints to Northwest Wyoming? Uh, they welcomed it. Um, saw it as a great opportunity. Uh, once Abraham Woodruff and uh, you know some others went up there to explore the region, they saw it as an opportunity to you know build another settlement. At that point, in um, at least in, in Utah, if not in other places, there's uh, a lot of sentiment that there's not enough good land to farm in places in in Utah. We need to look at places elsewhere in the Intermountain West to send some of our, our people in. And as uh, you know, the, the history of Latter-day Saint settlement is, is kind of like, you know, there's a series of, I mean, you could call them colonies or, or however you want to, settlements, whatever, but um, people are being asked to go to different places all the time. And this uh, was less a, an 
uh, asking people to go as it was seen as an opportunity. So as soon as they, uh, Abraham Woodruff comes back and reports to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and First Presidency, like there's some great opportunities up here in Northwest Wyoming. Um, there's a let's let's get some folks up there and yeah, let's make an impact. I think I think it was seen very positively um, in a. Uh, not at all in a like oh we're losing some of our our folks kind of idea. All right, well thank you again very much. Appreciate you.